um, this live stream, we're celebrating Earth Day. So before we get into the details of the live stream, um, I wanted to introduce myself and some of the other people who are here with us today. So uh, my name is Raya. Um, if you've met me before in kindergarten or grade one, then you might have known me as Raya Papaya. I also go by that name. And um, I am with an organization called Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. Maybe you can see it on my fleece here on my shirt. Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, TRCA. And so as an organization, we like to do a lot of things that help um, care for the environment and we teach about the environment. I'm a teacher, but not in a school. I teach outside. So today we also have Janelle helping us backstage. So Janelle can come on and say hello. Everyone. <laughs> and we have a couple of people, Jasmine and Sarah, helping in the chat as well. If you have any questions, and if you have access to the chat, you can put them into the chat or your teacher can put them into the chat. Um, and we'll have time at the very end where we'll answer a lot of questions. Janelle, if there's anything that comes up in the middle that we want to answer right away, just interrupt me. That's fine. Um, of course, we want to be respectful in the chat, but please do use the chat um, if you'd like to share anything or have any questions. And some of you might have a worksheet to go along with the live stream. So if you do, then I will show what it looks like. Um, then you can use that worksheet during the live stream. Um, if you don't, that's okay too. But there is a link that'll go in the chat about how to find, how to get to that worksheet, how to download the worksheet. So I think those are all the details I need to let you know about. Um, and as I mentioned before, what day is tomorrow? Yes, it's Earth Day. And so you might have been celebrating Earth Day at school today. Um, there's a school very close to where I am right now, and they were doing a litter cleanup earlier. Maybe they do that every Friday. I don't know. But um, they were doing a big litter cleanup in the area. Maybe that's something you've done as well um, to celebrate Earth Day and help take care of this wonderful planet that keeps us alive. Today, we are going to be exploring the space I'm in. But I wanted to start off... Um, in celebrating the earth and acknowledging and honoring the earth, I wanted to do a little bit of a land acknowledgement. So you maybe maybe at school, you started your day off with a land acknowledgement already. Um, so I'm just gonna add to that rather than repeat it. I heard a land acknowledgement once that really came, like it came right into my heart. I really connected with it. And um, the part of the land acknowledgement that I really connected so strongly with, well, the whole thing, but the part of it that I wanna share with you was where it was mentioned that we want to kind of acknowledge and recognize all the organisms on this planet, all the living things. That includes the swimmers and the diggers and the crawlers and the flyers. And that includes the four-legged and the six-legged and the eight-legged and the one-legged, if you think of snails, right? And the two-legged, like us. We're all sharing this beautiful land planet together. So um, I just wanted to take a moment. We'll have a look out at the land and recognize that this space is so significant, so important for our lives and for the lives of all living things. So thank you, land and water. All right, now, I have a question for you. I want you to think about where you live. Do you live in what many of us now call Mississauga, or do you live maybe in Brampton or York or Vaughan? Markham, maybe Toronto, that's where I live in Toronto. Think about where you live. And think about what neighbors you have around you for where you live. So maybe across the street, you see a neighbor who brings out the recycling once a week or twice every two weeks. Or maybe you have, you live in an apartment building and you're the person in the apartment next door, they're playing jazz music. And so you don't really know them, but you know that they love jazz music. So you kind of get to know your neighbors in different ways. And what I'd like you to do right now for just a moment is turn to a neighbor in your classroom. Maybe they're sitting in front of you or next to you, um, behind you. <laughs> turn to them and say, hi, Ahmed. It's really great to see you today. So just say hello to them. Maybe their name's not Ahmed. But say hello to them for a moment and then we'll come back. Okay, so say hello to your classroom neighbor for just a moment. <laughs> All right. Attention back here again, please. Bring your attention back here. Now that we've said hello to our classroom neighbors. Um, when we think about neighbors, we often think about humans, right? Well, I bet when you go outside, there are all kinds of animal neighbors around you too, like squirrels and raccoons and birds and insects. And 
there are all kinds of plant neighbors around you. Today, we're going to get to know our plant neighbors. And just like you might have said hello to your classroom neighbor, we are going to say hello to our plant neighbors. So um, I live in the east end of Toronto. And I came out to a space called the Meadowway in Scarborough, which is nearby, to get to know some of the plant neighbors in the Meadowway. And you could, go, you could get to know plant neighbors like just on your street, growing through the sidewalk cracks too. So I believe that somebody maybe has put a link to the Meadowway website if anybody's interested in learning more. But that is where I am right now. And I want to get started getting to know some of the neighbors in the Meadowway. So this spot here, this is a shrub area, shrub node. And this plant I want to start getting to know first looks like this up close. This is the seed head. So these are all seeds of this plant. I'll show another one. Maybe I can get better lighting. Let's see. We've got some shadows. So if you can see all those seeds, they're pretty fuzzy. This plant is called sumac. And you can see that the, um, the stems and the sort of trunks, the stems of the plant are kind of wonky. And in the summer, the sumac looks like the picture that Janelle just showed. So we can actually see the leaves. So we can start looking at different parts of the plant, think about the characteristics of the different parts as we explore the plant. And the sumac plant, it's called staghorn sumac because there are a few different types. So the sumac plant um, has these leaves in the summer and there are lots of visitors in the community of the sumac plant that like to eat the seeds or just visit the plant and make nests in it. So we can see in the next picture, there is a cardinal eating the seeds in the winter. So the sumac plant has a cardinal as a neighbor, an animal neighbor who likes to visit. Another animal neighbor who likes to visit is the catbird, the gray catbird. So they like to visit and eat the seeds as well. And if we look at the next picture, we can actually see that in the springtime, so these plants, they look different in different seasons, right? So in the springtime, actually moving closer to the summer, the plant makes flowers. So in the picture, you can see there are yellow flowers, looks nothing like what I'm pointing to here. And if we look up close, we can see what those flowers look like up close. Look at that, just gorgeous. I was a grown up before I knew what sumac flowers looked like. I'd never seen them before. So it was kind of cool when I saw them one time, I'm like, wait a second, I thought sumac had red berries and here I'm seeing yellow on the plant and it was the flowers. And then if we look up closely at another part of the plant, you can see the stem. So I can show it to you here as well. I've got this, oops, trying to turn my camera around a little bit, my friends. So the stem in the picture is much more up close, but you can see that the stem is sort of fuzzy. And if you see a sumac, you can touch the stem and my goodness, is it ever soft? Just wonderful. So we've gotten to know the sumac plant and I'm gonna ask everybody on three to say, hello, sumac, one, two, three. Hello, sumac. Awesome. <laughs> Getting to know our plant neighbors. I should make a little theme song. Oh, looks like there's a school coming. I'm gonna to try to keep them off the camera. From far away, you can see there's people over there um, walking on the trail. Getting to know their neighborhood too. So let's come down to the ground. Oh, you can see my shadow and see what other plant neighbors we can get to know. There is a very small plant. Now it doesn't stay small, but right now this plant is quite small and I can see next to it, there is a stem. And I know, cause I learned about this plant. Look at those leaves. They're kind of like, they look a bit like an arrowhead. Like they're a bit pointy and long. They're not sharp, but they're pointy and long. So I know that these actually are from the same plant. So this is from last year. You can see that the stem kind of like a square shaped stem or a rectangular prism if you know your math and so that's a really cool thing to know about this plant this plant is called cup plant and I'm going to ask Janelle to show you there we go a picture of cup plant when it is um, flowering so in different times of the year and we can see another picture just before the flowers burst oh there we go we can see a picture just before the flowers open up this is what it looks like so when you're learning about plants, what the beautiful thing is you can get to know them in all different seasons. Now that other picture that Janelle was showing shows the leaves and it looks like, kind of looks like there's one leaf that's just around the stem. It's, it's sort of like two leaves that are attached right in the middle. And there's a little bit of water in that middle part. So something that's cool to know about cup plant is that it actually collects water and then animals will come and drink from the water. It's like nature's drinking fountain. So coming back to my screen here, 
I was showing you this very small version of cup plant. It's just starting to poke out of the ground. And I call this a seedling. Seedlings are interesting. I, I brought some seedlings from home as well. And I'm going to put my phone down here. So use the tripod. There we go. So I bought some seedlings from home that I've been growing. And when I'm outside trying to get to know plants, I don't always get to know, like, I don't know who all the seedlings are because they can look um, all the same, right? So this plant, for instance, I'm trying to get both my hands in here. <laughs> this plant looks like the same as this plant and it's a, when it's a seedling. Well, I know only because I labeled the pot in the bottom that this plant is actually called wild bergamot and this one is called black eyed Susan. So they are two different plants. Pretty cool. But if I was out here exploring plants, I might just say, oh, cool. There are lots of seedlings here and just call them seedlings. And that's a good enough name if you don't know the name. Now, when we think about plants in different parts of their life, as you can see, I've got even another one here going in my, this was my oat milk carton. <laughs> um, when you think about plants in different parts of their life and getting to know them, then um, we can recognize that, okay, we know that, they look different in different parts of their life. Um, and that actually, when I think about it, like, have you seen a picture of yourself as a baby? Can you picture what you might've looked like? So do you look the same as you did when you were a baby? I'm guessing not. And that's the same as with plants. These seedlings will look so different as they grow. And we can learn about plants in different stages of their life. I'm gonna show you another stage of a plant's life in my hand in just a moment. Dun, da, da. See if I can get my hand into the screen here. What stage of a plant's life is this? This is even before they're a seedling, right? So these are their seeds. And um, if I'm out in a nature space, I might not know what all the different seeds are, but looking at here, I've started to learn about plants from their seeds too. So I can see that these big brown ones, that's a milkweed seed, it's a butterfly milkweed seed. And I know that these little tiny ones that look like little black dashes are black eyed Susan. And this bigger one here, that's a tall sunflower seed. So there's so many ways to get to know your plant neighbors, including in different parts of their lives. All right, let's go meet some more neighbors. Dun, dun, dun. Here we go. See so many seedlings. They can see a lot of brown and gray from last year, but I can also see a lot of green new plants coming up this year. Actually, I shouldn't say new plants. They were here last year. Their roots were still in the ground. They're just waiting for springtime to come. <gasps> cool, 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 cool. Okay, maybe you know this one. I'm trying to not to block it with the sun. Check out these pods. So here's the stem from last year. And it looks like it broke, maybe from the wind. And as we come down, we can see the pods here. And these pods, there's a little bit of fluff. You can see that they, this... This is actually where all these seeds were. Each pod had probably, gosh, might have had 200 seeds even in one pod. And the, the plant had one, two, three, four. Is there another one? Five pods. Gosh, well, what's 200 times five? That's a thousand. So this plant could have made a thousand seeds and probably even more we're not seeing if some pods fell off. Now this plant, my friends, is called milkweed. Milkweed. Everybody say milkweed. One, two, three, milkweed. And you might have heard about milkweed being important for a particular animal. There's a picture of what the milkweed looks like in the fall with all the seeds connected to the fluff. Um, and in the next picture, we can see what it looks like in the summer. And we can see that there is the animal, the monarch butterfly, that orange butterfly that relies on the milkweed for their life. And we can also see other animals who need the milkweed plant. There's a bee who's um, hanging out in the flower head looking for all these flowers to get nectar from and pollen. And there's another animal here. Look at these, even ants. These are, this is a real close up of the milkweed flowers in the flower head. So all these ants, they also love that nectar. So the milkweed plant, one of our neighbors, has all these animals as neighbors, which means they're our neighbors too. Oh yes, I forgot about this picture. So this is a monarch butterfly caterpillar when they're very young. And you can actually see they kind of chewed a hole that's in the shape of a butterfly into this milkweed leaf. Super cool. So many neighbors to get to know on this Earth Day. All right, so that was our friend, the milkweed. Let's 
keep traveling. Oh my goodness. What is this? All these dried yellow stems, leaves. This is a type of grass, my friends. And you might think, Raya, grass is just grass. It's what I play soccer on. What's the big deal? Well, there's actually different types of grass. So if I put my camera down, you can see that on the ground, there's some grass growing that we might plant. That's called Kentucky bluegrass. That's like turf grass. We might plant so that we have a place to have a picnic or play soccer. But there are so many different types of grass. And this grass here is called switchgrass. And if I can find one, let's, oh, there's one. So most of the seeds have fallen, but can you see those little bumps? Is it clear enough to see the, some little bumps on there? So there are a few seeds left in the switchgrass. Janelle's going to show a picture of what switchgrass looks like in the summer. You can kind of barely see it because it's so, um, I don't know, it, it's so thin, I guess, right? But what's so cool is as you get to know switchgrass, then you can see it in different seasons. And what's the next picture we have here? The next picture of our switchgrass is showing us maybe what it looks like when it's very young in seed form. So these are all switchgrass seeds that have been planted. As, uh, this is a picture again of the meadowway, so it's been planted here. And the next picture shows us what the switchgrass looks like up close when it's flowering. Did you know that grass makes flowers? It has to make flowers, otherwise it can't make seeds and grow new grass. So these are what switchgrass flowers look like. The part of a plant we don't often think about is a part we almost never see. And that is the part that I might be standing on, right? Well, not really standing on the part of the plant, but the part of the land where the plant is. What's underground? What part of the plant is underground? If you said roots, you're right. So when you think about the roots for the switchgrass, well, Janelle's going to show you a picture of just how long those roots are and what they look like. So the circled plant in this picture, you can see the roots, they're kind of, they're wiggly, but they kind of go straight down. They don't branch out all over the place. And the arrow on the side is pointing to the number three, three meters. I would like everybody to please stand up for a moment. Stand up in your spot. Don't move around the room, but stand up in your spot and stretch your hands way high in the air. Go on your tippy toes, stretch really, really, really tall, as tall as you can do a good stretch. Right now, you are maybe a meter, meter and a half, maybe a little over a meter and a half, but I don't think you're even two meters. This plant has roots that are longer than you are tall right now. Isn't that amazing? You can have a seat again, everybody, now that you've had your stretch, have a seat. So the switchgrass has these amazing long roots that help all the neighbors that are underground to survive as well. All right, we'll keep, oh, we'll say, we'll say hello to the switchgrass. Let's everybody say on three, we'll say, hello, switchgrass, nice to meet you. Ready? One, two, three. Hello, switchgrass, nice to meet you. <laughs> Excellent. All right, attention back here again. Let's keep exploring. What else? <gasps> What do we have here? Oh my gosh, this is so exciting. This is so exciting. So this plant, <laughs> look at these leaves. They're so unique. They're so different from other leaves. So this plant is a very special plant here. And I'm trying to be very gentle with it. I don't want to hurt, like break any of the leaves accidentally so they can't get, make more food. This plant is called wild lupin and it's really important for a butterfly called the carner blue butterfly we don't have any more carner blue butterflies in ontario they're not extinct from the world but they're not in ontario anymore because we don't have enough of this plant anymore there are other types of lupins that sometimes get planted and the carner blue butterfly can't survive with those plants they need the the wild lupin so we know what the leaves look like let's see what the flower looks like janelle's going to show that picture beautiful purple flowers. And if we look at it, oh, you can even see there's a bee that's visiting the wild loop and they love it too. If you, if you look up close at the flower, check that out. The bee and other pollinators have to actually get inside the flower in order to get to the pollen and the nectar. So they really have to know what they're doing. And in this picture, so this is when the lupin's older, but the leaves are the same as the leaves I'm showing you here, right? They match. So sometimes as the plant's growing, you can, you can compare different parts of the plant and be like, oh yeah, well, the leaves are the same. They have the same characteristics as the older leaves. So that's kind of a cool thing about this 
organism in this meadow habitat. All right, we've checked out sumac, we've checked out cup plant, we've looked at milkweed, we've seen switchgrass, we've seen the wild lupin. I have another plant. Oh, we've got a seed head here. I'm seeing more seedlings on the ground. Oh my goodness, this one I think, get my camera straightened out. I'm making a shadow here, but this one is goldenrod. That one I happen to know with the long leaves, lots of goldenrod here. But there's one more plant I wanted to point out to you. And, oh, it's not this one, but wow. These aren't flowers, but they look like flowers. That's so cool. Love it. Okay, I think that's a type of aster. The one I wanted to point out to you is this plant here. It looks a little different than the rest. It might not be in focus right now, but we'll go closer. I don't want to step into the meadow because there's lots of seedlings trying to grow, but I can lean over uh, carefully and bring the plant a little closer to the camera so we can see it up close. Check that out. This plant actually has leaves in another time of the year that smell like black licorice. Isn't that funny? So the plant's name is anise hyssop. And if you happen to see it, this is what it looks like. It's actually in the picture here that you're seeing. It's kind of at the end of its flowering. But if you happen to see any hyssop, you can rub the leaves. You don't even have to rip them up. You can just rub them to get the smell onto your fingers and then smell your fingers. And you'll smell that black licorice smell, which is so cool. All right, I'm starting to see some insects out here too, cool. So we have had a chance to meet a whole bunch of our plant neighbors. And what I'd like you to do at this point is to take a deep breath. Everybody breathe in really deep. Maybe you're wearing a mask, it's a little hard, but you can do it and breathe out. And we'll do that one more time. And breathe out. And think about the fact that you were able to breathe is thanks to plants. Plants gave you the air that you need to breathe to make your body work. <laughs> plants are keeping us alive. It's something that we kind of, oh yeah, plants clean the air, you know. We all kind of have heard that at some point probably, but to really think of it, like without the plants, we just wouldn't be alive. We wouldn't be able to, to survive because we wouldn't have air to breathe that could keep our bodies going. So if you can join me for just a moment, we're gonna say a collective thank you to the plants. I'm gonna point you to some plants here. And how about this? How about we say, thank you for helping me stay alive. One, two, three. Thank you for helping me stay alive. Wonderful. Oh, it's all about getting to know your neighbors and thanking them when they, <laughs> when they help us out, right? Um, okay, so you might be thinking, Raya, for Earth Day, isn't Earth Day about planting plants or like cleaning up litter? And a lot of, that's a really good, those are really good activities to do on Earth Day. Um, they're both examples of stewardship. Stewardship means, like taking care of something that doesn't belong to you, right? We don't own the earth. The earth helps us survive and we need to take care of it. So that is environmental stewardship, taking care of the environment. So by cleaning up litter, planting new plants, um, oh, not wasting water or maybe walking instead of driving, those are all really good ways to do stewardship. But getting to know your plant neighbors is another really good way to do stewardship. The more you know about your plant neighbors, the more you might accidentally learn about your animal neighbors. We learn about different butterflies and bees and, and, and birds who like to have a relationship in the communities with these plants, right? So we learned about the plants. That means we learned about some animals. And the more you learn about plants and animals living in your communities, the more we can care about them. So it all cascades down, it all connects. So you are doing stewardship by learning about plants. And, um, what I encourage you to do, maybe it's tonight, maybe it's on the weekend, is go out and see if you can find a plant you didn't really know before. If you have a worksheet, there's a spot for you to, um, to do this in the worksheet too. And if you get to know this plant that maybe you didn't know so well before, then you can say to the plant, hey plant, thanks for being here. 
I'm going to explore the plant's leaves. I'm going to explore the plant's um, seeds if I can find them, the stem, the trunk. You can explore them in all different ways. And once you get to know them, you can thank them for just being around. I know this one's called Evening Primrose. Hey, Evening Primrose, thank you for being here. If you want to get to know the plant names, there are actually different ways to do that. There are lots of books, of course. You have to explore the different characteristics, characteristics of the different parts of the plant. But um, there's also an, a few apps, like one is called Seek. And I think one of our helpers is going to put that in the chat, S-E-E-K, like looking for something. So you can use Seek. You point your device at the plant. It also works for animals. And um, it might be able to figure out the name of the plant just by looking at it. And then you can learn the name of the plant and you can actually use the name. And then when you're walking down the street, you see the plant, you're like, oh, hey, white pine tree. Nice to see you. You can kind of recognize them and talk to them and feel that connection even more to these living things in our communities. All right. So I'm just checking my notes. I think I've covered most things. Um, so by recognizing these plants, it's a great way to celebrate the earth and celebrate on Earth Day or any other day the living things in which you live or at which you're part of, really. We're all part of living things, right? We are living too. Um, so at this point, I um, am going to take questions. And if you need to go, you're welcome to go. But I wanted to put up one more picture before some of you might need to go. And this one, um, it's a picture of, I'm going to see if Danelle's put it up. It's a picture of the Medway at a different time of year and a different time of day. And I want you to think about, hmm, how many plants do I actually know in my neighborhood? It's a good chance for us to kind of reflect on how well we know the living things around us and that we're part of. All right, so like I said, I am available to take questions. Um, and if you need to go because it's recess or something, then by all means. But Janelle, have there really any, been any questions that have come up in the chat just yet? Not yet. We're still waiting. Oh, I do see one question come in. Um, I have a question that says, are there dangerous plants in Ontario? That's a great question. So the answer is a bit of a tricky one. The word dangerous can mean different things to different people. Um, poison ivy, some people react to it. And so I wouldn't want to rub my hands all over it. But there are animals, wild animals in Ontario who actually eat poison ivy and they need it. So it might seem like it's dangerous to us, but it's not dangerous to others. Um, and if you've learned about native and invasive plants, if you're in grade two or three, you probably haven't, and that's fine. But I'm just sharing for those who have in maybe grade four or five or six, poison ivy is a native plant. Now, there are some plants that aren't originally from this part of the world. And sometimes when they come to this part of the world, there's one I thought I saw. There it is. I can show it to you. So there's one called uh, dog strangling vine. This is from last year. And dog strangling vine isn't like if I'm touching it, it's not going to cause a problem. It's not dangerous to me, but it's dangerous for the habitat. If you've learned the word biodiversity, that means lots of different living things in a space. Well, oh, sorry, there's a school nearby. You might be hearing their announcement. <laughs> Um, so the dog strangling vine is an invasive plant that takes over and can be dangerous for the habitat and for the ecosystems and for other plants, but it's not dangerous to us. So that's a very good question. And it just depends on, on when we think about like dangerous for whom, right? For us or for other animals or maybe for other plants. Um, but there are some plants that can, um, make people feel not good, like poison ivy, stinging nettle. If you know how to cook it, you can eat it, <laughs> make a tea out of it. Um, but if you touch it, it makes your fingers, your skin sting. So there are things like that. Good question. Thank you for asking. Great. That is excellent. Um, this has been so great learning about all these plants. We have what, another question come in. Um, Isis wants to know if any native plants have chemicals in them. Also, what other native, or sorry, what other invasive plants should we know about? Ooh, oh my gosh, that's good questions. Do any native plants have chemicals in them? Well, I guess like the poison ivy I mentioned is a native plant and probably does have some kind of chemical that we react to, um, but chemicals can be in nature too. So um, like even the anise, anise hyssop, which I mentioned has, has that smell. 
So maybe it's a type of chemical that's causing it to have that black licorice smell. And it's not dangerous for us. Um, but chemicals just exist in nature. We often hear about chemicals being a really bad thing if they're like in our bleach or in our cleaning products. And we don't want to mix those harsh chemicals that are really intense up with the more natural chemicals. Um, and so, gosh. And, oh, another example. Oh, yeah. Um, citronella. I don't know if it's native or not. I can't remember. But citronella is... Um, from a plant that smell that some of people put on to avoid mosquitoes. So even though it's not as harsh as other, other mosquito sprays, it's still a chemical um, and it smells sort of lemony. So that's a really good question. And I probably answered it in a hard way <laughs> because chemicals are like, they're all around us and some of them are harsh and some are not. In Ontario, most native plants probably don't have harsh chemicals. I can say that with a certain degree of confidence. <laughs> and then the other question was other native invasive plants we might need to know about or are good to know about. So I mentioned dog strangling vine um, that can damage a habitat and other ones. Oh, this one actually, I'm going to go into this shrubby area. So in the meadow, it's mostly meadow, but there are a few spots that are more shrubby. And I noticed earlier that there's this plant. Maybe you've seen this plant before. Some of them are starting to have their little white flowers. I can't see my phone very well to see if you can see it. But the leaves, if I rub this leaf and then I smell it, can you smell it if I put my fingers to the camera? <laughs> smells like garlic. And this is called garlic mustard. And if we look here, we can see that this whole patch, it's spreading and spreading and spreading and really starting to take over. Garlic mustard is pretty happy to grow in shade. So it doesn't need sunny spots to grow. And so it can really take over these spaces pretty easily and it prevents other plants from growing. So that's another invasive plant that um, is sometimes in Ontario. There's a whole long list of invasive plants that, uh, that exists here. Another one that um, has a really a flower that people think, oh, it's so beautiful, is it's called creeping bell flower. And it has a little purple bell, like a light purple color. Um, but again, it takes over. That's another invasive plant. Periwinkle is another invasive plant. There are some plants from other places in the world that aren't invasive, like tulips. Tulips, they, they're not from here. Maybe not a lot of bees and butterflies like them, but, um, but they don't spread and they don't cause a problem for the habitat so much. So that was a really good question. Thank you for asking. Thanks, Raya. We have actually a few more questions coming in. Really exciting questions. Uh, the first one is, um, are there any native plants we can grow in containers at home or on our bal balconies? So 100% yes for balconies. Um, growing them in containers inside is a bit tricky because native plants, if they're native to this area, that means they need that cold winter um, in, in order to kind of shrink back and take a nice long nap and save their energy for the next spring. Um, but I have grown some native plants on my windowsill as well. And, um, and then I just plant new seeds the next year. So I grow them from seed. But if you're growing on your balcony, there are lots and lots of options. And um, like the ones I'm going to show you are the ones I have here. Let me try to get you out of the shadow, my friends. Okay. Show you with two hands. So I mentioned earlier, um, this one is wild bergamot. And maybe, Janelle, is it easy for you to find that photograph of wild bergamot when it's flowering to show? So wild bergamot has these purple flowers that look a bit like uh, like fireworks to me. The next one, I think. There we go. There's a bee in there. Um, so that one is a lovely plant to grow on balconies uh, if you have a sunny balcony available. They, these ones don't really like shade. They do like full sun. Um, and the leaves actually smell a bit like oregano. They're kind of minty. And then the other picture that Janelle just showed is the black-eyed Susan. So the black-eyed Susan, I can show it here while she shows the flower. Black-eyed Susan, they're pretty resilient, which means that they, they can put up with a lot. <laughs> so they grow pretty, fairly easily. And you can grow these on your balcony as well. Bees and butterflies love them too. Um, and they have these like, I don't know if you can tell, but they have sort of fuzzy leaves a little bit. Uh, another one, the one that I have in my carton here, and I, we don't have a picture of this one, but it's called common yarrow. And if I hold this up to the phone, maybe you can see, can I find one? Oops, so some of these seedlings, 
I'm snapping last year's cup plant stems. Some of these seedlings have like a little bit of a frilly seed starting up. The first, what look like leaves of these plants, I should tell you, they're not actually leaves. Technically, they're fake leaves. They're called, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it properly, cotyledons. <laughs> um, and then the second set of kind of leaves, that's quotation marks, are what the plant leaves look like. So can you see that? It's a little frilly. Common yarrow has tiny, tiny white flowers. You can also grow that in your balcony. Um, you can grow any hyssop in your balcony. A friend of mine has that. And so that's the one we looked at earlier with the licorice smell. Um, you can grow milkweed on your balcony as well. So a lot of these plants, even though they have the long roots we talked about, like the switchgrass, if you have them in a big pot in your balcony, the roots will just go round and round in the pot instead of going down. So they can still survive. And you can kind of put some uh, mulch, so maybe some leaves that you collect from somewhere, dried leaves in the fall, put them on top of the soil so that they have a little layer of protection over the winter. And then in the spring, if they have big pots, they should be coming back. But yeah, lots of other natives too that I haven't mentioned, but there's a lot of, that was a great question. I'm glad to hear somebody asked that. Yeah, that's excellent. I love growing uh, plants at home. So hopefully uh, you all can find some seeds uh, for some native plants and grow them as well. All right, we have another question coming in. Are stinging nettles native to Ontario? I believe they are. And maybe somebody in the chat, uh, Sarah or Jasmine, who are in the chat can confirm that. Um, I don't know a lot about stinging nettle, but I believe that it's a native species. I know that I have a neighbor who's always very excited when their stinging nettle comes up because I look forward to making tea. They just have to make sure they're wearing <laughs> wearing gloves when they handle it so they don't get that spiky feeling. Um, but Danelle, if you find out if it's native from somebody else to confirm, then that yeah. would be great. I don't want to give the wrong information. <laughs> I'll figure out. I think um, it, I'll, I'll double check. I'm going to do some uh, some research, but I think it may be a naturalized species, which means oh. that um, it's a species that wasn't it's not necessarily native to the area, but it's been here for a very long time um, and it gets along with all the other things around here. But I will double check for you. Um, and while I double check, I will give you the next, uh, the next question. Um, Kian is asking, how do plants help us live other than give us oxygen? Oh, what a wonderful question. Well, I would love for you to think about what you had for lunch today or what you had for breakfast. If you had cereal for breakfast, then that's because the wheat or the rice or whatever was in your cereal came from plants. If you had, even if you had a burger, like a meat burger for lunch, well, the if you had lettuce or tomato on that burger or ketchup on that burger, they came from plants. So plants give us a lot of food. And even if, if you're somebody who eats meat, then um, the animal had to eat plants to be alive, <laughs> the cow or the pig or whatever it is. So plants are a big part of, as far as how they help us, they give us a lot of food. Another thing is that the plants, um, this is getting a little bit more detailed, but you know when you have a massive, massive storm, a rainstorm, and then um, maybe there's flooding, like your basement's flooding or there's flooding on the street. Well, flooding can cause problems with these massive storms. And if you've heard of climate change, then you, you know that, oh, maybe climate change is connected. Like with climate change, we're getting more storms generally. Um, around the world, maybe not as much in Toronto, but around the world, storms are getting more intense. These native plants, at least, with their beautiful long root systems, they can help keep the soil really loose underground. And what that means that when we get all these, these massive storms, lots of water coming down, instead of that water running off the surface of the ground, the water actually sinks down into the soil where the plants are growing. And so by having these kinds of plants, they can help prevent a lot of flooding when we have these storms. So as we think about, well, how can we move forward if, you know, if our climate is changing? Well, we can have more of these plants that help keep the soil really healthy and loose underground so that when we have more storms, then the water can go down and doesn't cause flooding. <laughs> so that's one, that's another example. So we've got clean, like good clean air, food, um, helping with preventing flooding. And oh, they're just nice to look at too sometimes, right? <laughs> Um, yeah, thanks for asking that question. That was a good one. Sweet, thank you. Um, all right, we have another one. Hannah asks, are there any plants there uh, that you can just pick up and eat? If not, are there any plants that you can just eat if they're not in the meadow way? That's a good question. So I don't know about the rules for all the different regions around Toronto, but in Toronto, like I don't know about what it is for Brampton or for York, for instance, but in Toronto, I know that 
um, we're not actually supposed to harvest, which means pick the seeds or the fruits of sort of wild plants or plants that are growing that aren't on your own like property that you take care of. Um, but I can share some some things that I know about the plants that are around us. So for instance, I'm going to turn this back to our sumac plant. Um, so the sumac berries, I wouldn't do it now because especially this time of year, because they're not really fresh, but when they are more fresh, then they actually have a vinegar kind of taste to them. And I have sometimes um, in a place where I was allowed to do it, I picked some berries and I sucked on them and the seed is really hard in the middle there. So I spit that out, but it was so I love sour things. So it was so yummy and sour. So I sucked on it to get that yummy sourness and then I spit it out. I've heard people actually saying um, making sumac aid instead of lemonade. Sumac aid. So another kind of sour drink, add some maple syrup or something to make it yummy. Other plants that are around here. Um, oh, I wonder if I can reach this one without stepping in the meadow. Let's see. Can I reach over, Raya? Okay. So if you see these seed heads, I've got a couple in my hand here. I wonder if they have seeds inside them. So this is from a plant called wild bergamot, which we talked about a little bit before. These are the wild bergamot seed heads. And the leaves, I mentioned earlier, they taste, they smell a bit like oregano to me. Some people say they smell more like mint to them. Um, but I have heard of people making bergamot tea. So there are some plants like that you can make a tea out of. And I wonder, are there any seeds in this one? I don't see any flicking out. Sometimes when I do that gentle flicking, I can try it on this, um, which I think is a black-eyed Susan. See if I can flick some seeds out. Oh yeah. Do you see those black seeds in my hand? Sometimes I flick without even thinking about it, <laughs> but those seeds, I can sprinkle them so they fall to the ground and get more. Um, yeah, so the sumac, bergamot leaves, those are two examples of ones that we can sort of consume as long as we have permission. Some people, oh, dandelions. So there are some dandelions here. They're not native to here, but um, to people sometimes put dandelion leaves in salad or they'll make a tea out of dandelion leaves. And there's probably other examples I'm forgetting right now, but it's always good, even if I said, yeah, you can eat it. It's always good to do your own research about it. Like I know with garlic mustard, you can make a garlic mustard pesto, but you have to pick it at the right time of year. Otherwise it could cause like stomach problems and cause, cause problems. So you wanna do a little bit of your own research to make sure that things are safe to eat. Great question though. Excellent. I know that I had, um... I have some garlic mustard growing in my backyard. So uh, just on the weekend, actually, I picked some and then I fried it up with some butter and I had it with my egg. So it was oh, nice. very <laughs> lovely. <laughs> all right. I'm loving you seeing all the questions coming. There's actually a lot. So I'm happy that you guys have, are so interested in learning more about our earth and the plants here. So let's keep going. Um, I'll try to keep my answer shorter if, if there's that many. So that's great. <laughs> yeah, there's there's uh, maybe two or three coming in. So okay, good. Um, we did Hannah, Catherine Grace ask, what is the most popular plant in Ontario? Ooh. Oh, the one people, that's an interesting question. So a few come to mind right away. One of them is the one that people probably see the most without realizing it because it's on like license plates or driver's licenses or health cards. And that's the white trillium. So the white trillium is Ontario's provincial flower. It's a native species. Um, so that one might go into that popular category because people see it a lot, even if they don't know what it's called. Um, other plants that are pretty popular around here, cedar, the cedar, are there any here that I can show you? Not right here. The cedar um, is more of like a tree and the leaves, oh, they smell so good to me. They just smell so like fresh and you can make a tea out of those leaves as well. A lot of people like cedar hedges um, if they have a lawn. Um, if I'm in, I live in a house on the second floor of a house. I don't have any lawn or outdoor space for me, um, but my landlords have planted a little bit of cedar outside and I just love um, seeing that it's there and seeing the birds kind of crawl into the middle. So cedar, eastern white cedar is another popular one. Um, probably the trees are, are ones people know about more than the wildflowers, like the ones we've been talking about today. But black-eyed Susan is another one that a lot of people have heard about at least. Oh, and milkweed, that's another popular one. As you can tell, I can ramble on forever about plants. <laughs> Excellent. Um, actually, Harlow also asked a pretty similar question. What's the most popular plant you have at the conservation area? Um, I would probably say those same ones as well. Um, I think so, yeah. Keon says, thank you for the answer that you answered um, as well. Oh, you're so, much, you're so welcome. <laughs> um, and then we actually got a, a answer from about um, 
Stingy Nettle from uh, some of the people that we have on the background here. So it seems like there's a few different types of Stingy Nettle and some are native to North America and others are not. So that's an answer to the Stingy Nettle. That's the same with the lupin. Remember I was like, oh, people, sometimes people plant other types of lupin. Well, the wild lupin is native to here, but the other lupins and they come in all these different colors, they're actually not native to here. So that's a good, good thing to be aware of that sometimes we can learn about plant names, but not realize, oh, wait a second. Do I have the native one or the not native one? Yeah, excellent, thank you. It's true, common names are tricky. Well, it seems like though that may be the last of the questions that we have here in the chat. Thank you all for participating. Again, if any other questions come in, we'll do our best to answer them. Uh, but for now, that's all I have for you, Raya. Okay, thank you so much, Janelle. So thank you everybody so much for watching. I just wanted to stop at this sign. This is a this is a no mow area. No mowing here. Um, this is about the meadow way where we where I am right now, where we are right now. But again, you can go anywhere in your neighborhood, look for plants growing in the sidewalk cracks, and learn about all kinds of different plant neighbors. Get to know them, and it's a really, like I said, a wonderful way to celebrate Earth Day and be a like a more knowledgeable part of your natural community. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Our next live stream is June 5th, and it's on World Environment Day Plastic Solutions. I believe it's for grades four to six, so tune in then. Have a wonderful weekend. Happy Earth Day, and take care. Bye-bye. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Um, there was one more question coming in. How many types of flowers are there? Uh, Raya has, uh, she says, oh, are you here still? Sorry. I'm here still. <laughs> Thanks for the thanking everything. I was, I realized I was muted and trying to talk, but yeah, one last question came in really fast. Sure, yeah. <laughs> so how many types of flowers are there? Oh, what a wonderful question. I think almost, every plant. I don't think all of them reproduce by flowers, like mosses don't reproduce by flowers. Sorry, somebody's taking a bicycle through the meadow. It makes me sad. They're crushing all the seedlings. Um, so most plants that exist produce flowers, like even all the trees, you're like, oh, I didn't know maple trees had flowers. They do because that's how they make seeds. So I don't have a number for you, but it has to be in the, like around the world in the hundreds of thousands. Like it has to be because I imagine that's how many plants, how different plants are around the world. Um, so yeah, next time when you think, like we talked about the grass having flowers that we don't always think about. Um, next time that you come across a plant and you're like, not thinking that it might produce a flower. Well, it probably does, unless it's maybe a type of moss or, or a lichen, which is kind of like a plant. You're, yeah, I just did a quick, Google search and it says there's over 400 types or 400,000 different types of flowers. And I will say that sometimes, yeah, there's flowers that we don't think about and we may have not even discovered or described or realized are there. So there's lots and lots of different types of flowers. Thanks, Raya, for answering that last minute question. <laughs> and I can say the tiniest flowering plant, the tiniest flowering plant is called duckweed. Um, and it's a little tiny, like it looks like a little green thing when you don't see the flower. I don't know what the flower looks like, but it's a little tiny, tiny green thing that sits on top of water sometimes um, in wetlands or in ponds. So duckweed is the world's smallest flowering plant, I believe. Ooh, <laughs> you can look that up. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, so much. Janelle, that's it for questions then? That's it. All right. Happy Earth Day. Take care. Bye-bye. Happy Earth Day. Bye. -bye. Happy Earth Day. Bye.